uh, good afternoon. Um, I would like to begin by briefly saying how much I appreciate the effort that Al Byrne and Mary Lynn Mathry have put into this conference, to the uh, support that the University of Iowa has given it. Uh, it's both exhilarating and uh, distressing uh, to see where we're at. Um, I, I realized yesterday someone approached me and, and started talking about medical marijuana, and I realized that everyone believes the world begins when they arrive. Um, and I think it's important that I say that Todd McAria's book, Marijuana Medical Papers, uh, arrived before I did and was uh, a great assistance to me. Um, for those of you interested, it's a history of what would be called modern Western clinical science on marijuana from the 1850s to the 1940s. It's an excellent uh, indication that this is not a new subject. Um, in the uh, modern med medical vernacular, I guess I would be described as patient zero. That point in time where questions of personal need, uh, mischance, getting arrested, uh, came together uh, and for the first time made marijuana and its medical use is a public issue. Um, I'm going to try to go through my medical history very quickly and very briefly um, with the danger of getting sidetracked all along the way. I first used marijuana on the day Richard Nixon was elected president in November of 1968. I found it a delightful substance. Um, and in my late teens, I developed some visual symptoms, tricolored halos around lights and occasionally a whiteout of vision. Uh, these were diagnosed as eye strain. Um, I left college in 1971 and moved to Washington, D.C. Um, in mid-1970, and did not smoke marijuana um, because I simply didn't know anyone. Um, in mid-1972, I was reading a book and wiped one eye and realized I could not see the page with the other eye. Um, I was uh, introduced to a very renowned ocular pathologist, Dr. Ben Fine, who within a matter of minutes diagnosed me as having chronic open angle glaucoma, juvenile variety. Um, his prognosis at the time of diagnosis was that I had already lost 85% of the vision in both eyes with a loss of central field in the right eye and uh, that I could expect under the best of medical treatment to be blind within three to five years. Uh, a sobering diagnosis if you're 24 years old. Um, Dr. Fine was not a surgeon. Uh, and unlike surgeons who have great uh, faith in their abilities, very honestly discussed with me what my future would be if I went into surgery. That there was a one in three chance of the surgery because of the extensive damage already existing would blind me. That there was less than a 30% chance that the surgery would be successful, and that even if the surgery were successful, it would probably cause the formation of cataracts, causing additional surgery. And because of my age, 24, and my life expectancy in another 50 years, multiple surgeries would have to occur over a period of time. Uh, he recommended strongly against surgery. I was placed on conventional therapy, and as he suspected, and as is typical with juvenile glaucoma, there was a rapid onset of tolerance to all available therapies. Uh, put simply, a drug would work for a period of weeks or months or days before it simply failed to work. Um, by 1973, I was on all the available glaucoma medications. I was experiencing tricolored halos, which I recognized as symptoms of elevated ocular pressure. And I was in the process of going blind. Uh, someone gave me two joints uh, for the reason that most people smoke joints, to have fun. I went home, uh, looked out my window, saw a street light with a tricolored halo around it. Um, didn't think much of it. It was becoming part of my life. Uh, smoked a joint, um, got distracted. Uh, Forty-five minutes later, looked out the window and realized the halo was gone. And there was an epiphany, an immediate uh, understanding at every level, um, mental, physical, 
that marijuana was helpful in the treatment of my glaucoma. Uh, now, the next morning, I woke up thinking that was magical thinking. I was uh, 27 year, 25 years old. Uh, I was on the verge of going blind. The, the best of modern medical treatments were not halting the progress of my disease. And the idea that a weed that I associated with pleasure was somehow going to help to prolong my sight struck me as fanciful. Um, the delusion of despair. Um, for the next six months, I underwent sort of a trial and error, very informal. Uh, on days I had marijuana, I would not have tricolored halos. On days that I didn't have marijuana, I would have tricolored halos. Uh, on days when I had tricolored halos and obtained marijuana, uh, I would smoke and within 45 minutes the halos would go away. It was quite clear to me uh, that marijuana had medical value. Uh, I think this is an important point. Uh, the therapeutic applications that we are talking about in glaucoma, in spasm control, in nausea and vomiting control, these are not discrete and elusive effects. As a uh, cancer patient once told me, Robert, when you're puking up your Nikes and you smoke a joint and stop vomiting three minutes later, you don't need a guy in a white lab coat from FDA to tell you that's a medical benefit. These are transparent not elusive. Um, I began using marijuana medically. I did not inform my doctor. I did not run into the street to announce my great discovery. My only interest as a patient was in preserving my sight. The problem I ran into was marijuana was illegal, it's expensive, and it's often unavailable. Uh, to compensate for that, I grew a small number of marijuana plants on a sun deck in downtown Washington, D.C. <laughs> But the plants were quite lovely. Uh, I last saw them, they were six feet tall. And I went on vacation and came home to find that someone had stolen my marijuana plants and that the thieves had left a search warrant. Um, so I turned myself in for arrest, hired some attorneys. And uh, they said, Robert, did you grow the marijuana? I said, of course, I grew the marijuana. And they said, well, then you're guilty. And I said, no, I had a medical reason for growing the marijuana. And they rolled their eyes. They had never heard of marijuana being used medically and said, you'll have to prove that. Within a week, I lived in Washington, DC. It was easy for me to call into the bureaucracy. And, and based on leads I had picked up from uh, people at normal pay, newspaper clippings, I began calling into the federal government to find out some answers. And. Uh, Three out of the five people I called at FDA and DEA, I, I would simply say, hi, my name is Bob Randall. I've just been arrested for growing marijuana and I have glaucoma. Three out of the five people stopped me and said, oh, it's good that you're using marijuana. We have studies to show that that's helpful. What I found out is that the federal government had known serendipitously, as I found out, in 1970 that marijuana could lower interocular pressure. Uh, that despite the fact that marijuana is the leading cause of preventable blindness in the United States, the federal government had never bothered to aggressively pursue this information. But an ongoing study at UCLA uh, had documented uh, over 200 patients, normal research subjects, with reductions in eye pressure and 10 patients with glaucoma who experienced reductions in eye pressure on acute dosing, in other words, one-term dosing. Uh, Briefly, I went into that study. The conclusion of that study was that if left on conventional medications, I would go blind. Uh, that if given oral THC, I would go blind. Oral THC, for reasons of tolerance, was simply not effective in lowering eye pressure. But if I used smoked marijuana in combination with one other conventional drug, my eye pressure could be controlled and my sight might be prolonged. Uh, I went through a number of additional studies to confirm that conventional drugs would not work. Uh, in 1976, I presented that evidence to a court, arguing a, a very rare kind of common law defense called necessity. I argued that any sane person who knew they were going blind, who knew that marijuana could prevent them from going blind, would break the law to obtain marijuana, and that that activity was not criminal, but an act of self-preservation. Uh, the courts agreed, and through another complicated procedure, which 
we don't need to go into, I began receiving legal access to marijuana for the treatment of my glaucoma. Uh, I was the first person in the United States to receive such treatment. Um, the Japanese have a saying, uh, the nail that sticks out gets pounded back. Uh, 1977 was a very difficult year. I would speak out about my medical use of marijuana and uh, I would have a, an intense bureaucratic reaction. Uh, finally, uh, the government decided to simply terminate my access to marijuana. It wasn't that they didn't believe it worked. It was simply they didn't want to deal with it. Uh, actually, one very high-ranking NIDA official took me aside and said, Robert, you can smoke marijuana for the rest of your life. No one in the federal government will ever bother you unless you buy a purple trip van and end up in front of a grade school passing it out to kids. But we are not going to bother you. We just can't allow you to use it legally. Um, it, it, let me translate that into English. We're willing to let you go blind to maintain the legal fiction that marijuana is medically useless. Uh, I sued the federal government, um, and that's too complicated to go into. But essentially, within 24 hours of filing the lawsuit, the government uh, requested a settlement. Under the conditions of that settlement agreement, understanding, whatever you want to call it, um, something called the Compassionate IND Program was created. It allowed for the therapeutic use of a non-marketable product in the United States for the first time. Uh, in particular, it allowed me to have legal access to marijuana on the basis of a prescription written by my physician, which would be honored by a designated pharmacy. Uh, I have used marijuana under those medical conditions for the last 22 years. Um, my prescription has remained constant over those 22 years. I have been constantly monitored by an FDA authorized physician. Uh, his conclusions, which are made available to FDA on a yearly basis, are that marijuana has preserved my eyesight. Not only has it controlled my interocular pressure, but it has prevented a further progression of visual field loss. Uh, those are the two critical definitions of success in glaucoma therapy. Um, now, in the time that I have benefited from this, and my sight has been prolonged. 250,000 Americans, at a minimum, have lost their sight to glaucoma. Those people are not given access to marijuana. Their physicians cannot prescribe it. They do not have pharmacy access. Um, and they are just one subset of large populations of people with cancer, with AIDS, with multiple sclerosis who are being denied care in an attempt to maintain a legal fiction. Um, this is a very hard thing to accept, that uh, despite overwhelming factual evidence, historical, clinical, uh, ancient, modern, um, there is simply a process of denial within the federal government by unelected bureaucrats. And these unelected bureaucrats are willing to ignore the will of the people as expressed through their legislatures, their state legislatures, as expressed at the ballot box, and as expressed by the courts. Um, now, I'm a rationalist. I honestly believe that facts matter. Uh, I believe that the government has an obligation to be honest to the facts. Um, but I would compare this current situation to the same situation that Galileo confronted. Uh, Galileo took a telescope and looked at the moon and found that there were craters. He looked at the sun and found there were spots. He looked at Jupiter and found that there were moons. All of these things were, in terms of Catholic cosmology, impossible. Catholic cosmology said the heavens were perfect. Um, Galileo said, look through the telescope. The telescope was condemned as an instrument of the devil. Galileo was uh, deemed a heretic. Um, the obvious fact of a thing uh, does not change the nature of power. And as long as those people in power 
choose to ignore the facts and are not made to heed to the facts, uh, patients in this country will not get the legal access to marijuana they need. Um, I should say one other thing. I have not had, I, I sort of vanished from this issue in 1995. Um, in late 1994, I was diagnosed with AIDS. And I think I, without being as precise as I can be with glaucoma, I mean, glaucoma is an arithmetic condition. Your eye pressure is either 18 millimeters of mercury or 35 millimeters of mercury. And that can be very precisely measured. Um, but marijuana has made a profound difference in my AIDS therapy. When I was diagnosed with AIDS, uh, I had a T cell count of 22. Most people, most people have a T cell count of uh, 1,200 to 1,400. AIDS is generally considered to develop at a T cell count of 200 or 250. At that point, patients begin to run into all sorts of life-threatening opportunistic diseases and conditions. Uh, they experience grave fatigue, they experience exhaustion, and uh, rapid weight loss. Uh, when I was diagnosed in uh, November of 1994, I was uh, 50 pounds overweight, uh, and I, my only complaint was mild fatigue and a slight cough. Um, my muscle mass was still intact, um, and I was in tremendous shape. I mean, most people with a T-cell count of 22 are dead and I was still living a very active life. Um, I went through a medical crisis. I quit using marijuana because I reasoned that you don't need to uh, preserve your sight if you're going to be dead. Um, and everyone expected me to die. In November of 1996, I'm sorry, in, in uh, March of 1996, I resumed using marijuana. I had quit using it because of a weakness in vital signs uh, and uh, suffered more sight loss in that period of six months than I had in the previous 20 years. But the reintroduction of marijuana, which I began in March 1996, had a number of profound effects. At the time, I still had a T cell count of six, uh, which meant that I would die with any opportunistic disease, and I weighed less than 125 pounds. Um, I was placed on antiviral therapies. The vast majority of people on antiviral therapies experience toxic effects, nausea, vomiting, and rapid weight loss. I never experienced those. Uh, within a period of six months, my body weight increased by one-third. Um, I now have a T-cell count of nearly 500. Uh, I'm in seemingly good shape. and. Um, what until 1996 was an inevitably terminal disease has seemed to me to be a chronic condition. Uh, I believe that marijuana's use in AIDS therapy is of critical importance. In the United States, it's a means of alleviating the adverse effects of antiviral therapies. In Africa, where rates of HIV infection are now double digit, often over 25%, uh, marijuana could afford people with a cheap, inexpensive, means of improving the quality of the lives they have left. Uh, I think this is a matter of critical importance, and I hope that uh, I can find a way of dealing with that.